Copyright 2008 Summum. All rights reserved. Explore, wonder, discover. HTTP colon slash slash worldwide web dot summum dot us. www.summun.us. Summum. Sealed, except to the open mind. My summum bonum amen ra the summum philosophy is simply based on nature's own workings. It is nothing new and has been passed along throughout the ages. References to it may be found all around, in other religions and philosophies. Nature expresses it every day. While a full explanation is not given here, the philosophy is covered in depth through the book Summum, sealed, except to the open mind which is freely available from our website. Topics of even greater depth are examined inside the pyramid which is a collection of discourses given by Corky Ra. Introduction When the student's mind is open, then comes the voice to fill it with wisdom. Summum This book is dedicated with gratitude to the some individuals who untiringly work the pathways of spiritual evolution, and who with great concern have presented to me these principles. These teachings cannot be accredited to any one person or human source, for these teachings represent the workings of creation itself. These principles have been presented previously to those souls evolved enough to understand them, and again the nature of creation is presented to those now ready. 1. The Summum Philosophy The voice of wisdom is silent, except to the open mind. Summum. The Summum Philosophy embodies the principles of creation itself. From grand cycle to grand cycle the fundamental esoteric teachings of the Summum Bonum are taught to select advanced souls who then progress to new spiritual levels. The last recorded reservoir of these teachings on planet Earth has been found in Egypt, a home of the pyramids. All nations have borrowed from the ancient inheritance of Egypt. India, Persia, China, Japan, Ancient Greece, Rome, and other countries partook liberally at the Feast of Knowledge which the masters of the land of Ra and Isis so freely provided for them. The grand principle of creation is presented here for your examination. It is the answer to the greatest mysteries which dwell within the thinking human mind. No record of this principle may be found anywhere, except within this book. With diligence and openness, study, learn, and apply the principles and techniques presented in this work. As you progress, you will gain an understanding and come to know the grand principle of creation. Before the material universe manifested there was no thing. If there was no thing, nothing, then it must have been possible for nothing to be. If it is possible for no thing to be, then it must be possible for everything to be, all matter, space-time, all relativity, all this must be possible. If there is all possibility, then there must be the possibility of the no thing, nothing. In the same fashion it must be possible for all things to be, some of Automatically, with no beginning and no end, do these grand opposites come in and out of bond infinite times in a finite moment, therefore creating a series of infinite events. These infinite events, held within the finite moment of singularity, manifest as infinite conceptualized energy that is then externalized through phenomenal, inconceivable projections, limitless in number. Among these countless projections, one produced your universe through an extreme rapid expansion, what has been called the Big Bang, an event. In essence, there are infinite Big Bangs creating infinite universes whose origin is an eternal, finite moment of infinite events, all produced by nothing and possibility. A corollary to this grand principle is, it is impossible for two things to join in harmony or discord without the presence of a third, for a bond must exist to unite them, the copulation generates some of It is the bonding of nothing and possibility infinite times within this finite moment which is the birth of the cosmos and all subsequent events. It takes the joining of two to make one, some of Although your physicists and astronomers have determined the origin of the material universe, they are incapable of determining the moment just prior to the Big Bang. This cannot be examined by formulas, because formulas use the methodology of the material universe. 
just prior to the event, singularity, spacetime and therefore matter did not exist, so it is impossible to make formulations based upon the non-reality of these systems. To be totally correct one would have to say there was no moment just prior to the Big Bang, for time did not exist. So when physicists try to examine the origin of the creation, they must be confined to studying philosophical states, and they are not comfortable doing this at this time. Physicists who deal in quantum mechanics state, you cannot, objectively, observe something without changing it in the process. This statement is based upon what is termed the uncertainty principle, which means that, when you observe one aspect of a thing, such as an electron, you are forever uncertain of any other aspects of that same thing when consequently, they are restricted to using collections of probabilities in describing the motion of things. Further, they state that the existence of the collection of probabilities establishes what would happen, if an observation occurred. Note that the term probabilities is closely related to the term possibilities. To the extent that the uncertainty principle is applied to the origin of the universe, you can readily understand the problem with the physicist's objective measurements, observations. No objective measurements are possible in solving this problem. The grand principle of creation embodies your subjective observation of creation itself, in which the process of observation between nothing and possibility produces the event of creation. This condition, in which the two grand opposites are poised in opposition to one another, results in summum, the sum total of everything. When one state of being observes another, there is created an automatic connection between the two. It is this relationship between possibility and nothing which generates this incredible event. The event includes all outward manifestations and appearances which you know under the terms of the material universe, the phenomena of life, matter, energy, space-time, distance, speed, relativity, and, in short, all that is apparent to your material senses. Summum, created by the copulation of nothing and possibility, is spirit, and may be considered and thought of as a universal, infinite, living mind. This mind is the effect of creation's copulation, manifesting the qualities of nothingness and, summum, possibility. From the copulation of creation emanates the seven great principles of summum, psychokinesis, correspondence, vibration, opposition, rhythm, cause and effect, and gender. These principles are the nature of the grand copulation of creation. 1. Despite the uncertainty principle's significant role in quantum mechanics, it can only be considered partially true due to the effect of paradox. The Divine Paradox which is discussed later in this work, reveals that all truths are only partially true and must be applied in the examination of anything. The einstein podolsky rosen thought experiment demonstrates the ability to know more information about a system than the uncertainty principle would allow, hence the infamous Epper Paradox. The recent demonstration of teleportation through entanglement which utilizes Epper means to transport quantum states from one point to another exploits the restrictions of uncertainty. Yet regardless of the methods scientists use to examine the universe, as long as they confine themselves to objective measurements, observation, the mystery of creation will always remain elusive. 3. 7 Summum Principles the principles of knowing creation are seven, those who know these possess the magic key to whose touch all locked doors open to creation. Summum. The seven great summum principles upon which the summum philosophy is based are, as follows, I. Second. Third. Fourth. B. Sixth. Seventh. The principle of psychokinesis. The principle of correspondence. The principle of vibration. The principle of opposition. The principle of rhythm. The principle of cause and effect. The principle of gender. The seven great principles will be discussed and explained at length in this work. A short explanation of each, however, will be given at this point, for all the principles of summum have an interrelationship with each other.
the objective observation of creation, including the principles of psychokinesis, correspondence, vibration, opposition, rhythm, cause and effect, and gender, requires a discussion of proportion, for all seven principles of summum can be objectively discussed in their relation to proportion. It is the influence of the rule of proportion on the objective observer which causes humankind to ascribe to creation human emotions, feelings, and characteristics. Through genetics, all these descriptions survive from the days of the childhood of the race. This depiction of creation is the natural memory held within every cell of your body inherited from the evolution of the race. You are genetically bound and bound within your essence, for it is your inheritance. The objective observer, bound by the rule of proportion in the examination of the existent universe, discovers both an organized universe and a universe in chaos, rational and irrational numbers, beauty and ugliness, love and hate, pleasure and pain, harmony and discord, sanity and insanity, truth and falsity. These descriptions are merely proportional effects of opposition and the other principles of summum. The objective observers within this universe see harmony expressed by those emotions, feelings, and characteristics present within themselves. This harmony is viewed within nature and the universe as the divine proportion. Although the proportions seem to be fixed in nature, they are not. The only reason they seem fixed is, because they are fixed within the observer's mind. These fixed mental vibrations dictate the observer's likes and dislikes, happiness and sadness. They also dictate one's sense of pleasure and pain, beauty and ugliness, love and hate, truth and falsity, resulting in one being captive of these memories fixed by both body and mind. For, if the observer were to view nature from an altered state of consciousness, the proportion would also be altered. From a quantum viewpoint, multiple fields of consciousness are viewed simultaneously. If you could behold the consciousness of both a snail and a human simultaneously you would realize that pieces of gravel are as boulders to snails but pebbles to humans. Times and lengths, space-time, and mass are all altered in proportion when the body concerned is in motion relative to the observer. In other words, moving bodies appear to be altered in terms of their shape, size, and speed, depending on your viewpoint. Apparent increase of mass in swiftly moving particles has been observed. For example, when an electron is accelerated it appears to gain Massachusetts. Einstein's special theory of relativity embodies the mathematical essence of proportion and the interrelationship of the principles of summum. An altered state of consciousness makes a quantum leap beyond any fixed state of observation demonstrating that the divine proportion is also subject to the law of paradox and only partial truth. The divine proportion ascribed to the collective consciousness of your state of evolution has been expressed, for of three, three, magnitudes, if the greatest, a, is to the mean, c, b, as the mean, c, b, is to the least, a, c, they therefore all shall be one. The principle of cause and effect underlies all scientific thought, ancient and modern. While many and varied disputes between the many disciplines have since arisen, they have been principally about the details of the operations of the principle and sometimes about the meaning of certain words. The underlying principle of cause and effect has been accepted as correct by all scientists and metaphysicians. To believe otherwise would be to take the phenomena of the universe from the domain of law and order and relegate it to the control of the imaginary, a circumstance which humans call chance. A little consideration will prove that there can be no such agent as pure chance. Webster defines the word chance as the happening of events without apparent cause. In a sense one would be saying that an event is outside of law, beyond the laws of cause and effect. How can something act in the phenomenal universe independent of the laws, order, and continuity of the universe? Such a thing would be entirely independent of the universe and therefore superior to it. Yet there is nothing outside of summum belonging to such a law, because summum is the law in itself. There is no room for something outside of and independent of law. The existence of such a thing would render all natural laws ineffective and would plunge the universe into chaotic disorder and lawlessness. 
careful examination will show that what you call chance is merely an expression relating to obscure causes, causes that you cannot perceive, causes that you cannot understand. The word chance is derived from the word meaning to fall, as the falling of dice, which approximates the idea that the fall of the dice is merely a happening and related to any cause. This is the sense in which the term is generally used. But upon closer examination, it can be determined that there is no chance whatsoever concerned with the fall of the dice. Each time a die falls and displays a certain number, it obeys a law as infallible as that which governs the revolution of the planets around the Sunday. Behind the fall of the die are causes or chains of causes extending further than the mind could trace. They may include the position of the die in the hand, the amount of muscular energy exerted in the throw, the condition of the table, etc. All are causes, the effect of which may be perceived. Yet beyond these seen causes are chains of unseen preceding causes, all having a bearing upon the number on the die which comes up. If a die is tossed a great number of times, the count of each number that comes up will turn out to be nearly equal, that is, an equal number of one spots, two spots, three spots, etc. Toss a coin in the air and it may come down either heads or tails. But make a sufficient number of tosses, and the heads and tails will about even up. This is the operation of the law of averages. Both the averages and the single toss come under the law of cause and effect. If you were able to examine the preceding causes, it would be clear that it was simply impossible for the die to fall other than it did under the circumstances and at that time. Given the same causes, the same results will follow. There is always a cause and a because to every event. Nothing ever happens without a cause or, rather, a chain of causes. Some confusion exists by those considering this principle due to the fact that they are unable to explain how one thing could cause another that is, how one thing is the creator of a second thing. As a matter of fact, no thing ever causes or creates another thing. Cause and effect deals only with events. An event is that which comes, arrives, or happens as a result or consequent of some preceding event. No event creates another event, but is merely a preceding link in the great orderly chain of summum. The events are the bonds between cause and effect, the force and energy of creation. There is continuity between all events precedent, consequent, and subsequent. There is relation existing between everything that has gone before and everything that follows. A stone is dislodged from a mountainside and crashes through a roof of a cabin in the valley below. At first, you may regard this as a chance effect or act of God. But when you examine the matter, you find a great chain of causes behind it. In the first place there was the rain which softened the earth supporting the stone and allowing it to fall. Besides the rain was the influence of sun and wine which gradually chiseled the piece of rock from a larger piece. Then there were the causes which led to the formation of the mountain, its upheaval by convulsions of nature, and so on ad infinitum. Then you might follow the weather patterns which produced the rain, and the materials that the roof was composed of. In short, you would find yourself involved in a mesh of cause and effect from which you would soon strive to disentangle yourself. Just as a human has two parents, and four grandparents, and eight great-grandparents, and sixteen great-great-grandparents, and so on, until the number of ancestors run into many millions, so is it with the number of causes behind even the most trifling event or phenomenon. Consider the passage of a tiny speck of soot before your eye. It is not an easy matter to trace the bin of soot back to the early period of the planet's history, when it formed a part of a large tree. Follow it from the tree which was converted into coal, to the coal which fueled a fire, to the speck of soot now passing before your eyes on its way to other adventures. A mighty chain of events, causes and effects brought the speck of soot to its present condition. It is but one of the chain of events which will produce other events continuing on hundreds of years from now, and including the inspiration for this next description. Let us examine the task of rewriting these lines for this day and age. Utilizing a computer and word processing program, we input, convert, and store data on a floppy disk. 
The floppy disk is inserted into a typesetting computer. The typesetting computer produces and prints out the set type. Proofreaders then perform their job. The edited copy is sent to the printer. The printer prints the book. The book is distributed to bookstores. You see this book in a bookstore and buy it. You read it, and it arouses certain thoughts in your mind and that of others reading it, which in turn affects others, and so on, and on, and on. The events continue beyond the ability of humans to calculate further. Just ponder a moment. If a certain man had not met a certain woman in the dim period of the Stone Age, you who are now reading these lines would not be here in the form that you now inhabit. Every thought you think, every act you perform, has its direct and indirect results which fit into the great chain of cause and effect. In consideration of free will, remember the law of paradox. On one hand you do make choices and direct your lives on a conscious level. But the direction of those choices are a result of cause and effect, and the partially wise become disillusioned by their refusal of the acceptance of destiny. The summum teachings are that humankind is both free and yet bound by necessity, depending upon the meaning of the terms and the level at which the matter is examined. That is, because the further the creation is from the center, the more bound it is. As it comes closer to the center, the more free it becomes. The majority of humans are more or less slaves of heredity and environment and exhibit very little freedom. They are swayed by the opinions and customs of the exterior world, and also by their own emotions, feelings, moods, etc. They show very little mastery of self. They indignantly protest this assertion, saying, Why, I certainly am free to act and do, as I please. I do just what I want to do. They fail to explain where the want to, and as I please come from. What makes them want to do this, that, or anything? The Summa Master can change these pleases and wants into the will to will, instead of being moved, because some feeling, mood, emotion, or environmental suggestion arouses a tendency or desire within them to do so. They are the masters of their desire, not a slave to their passion. The majority of humans are manipulated by heredity and internal moods, desires, etc. Not to mention outside influences such as the suggestions and will of others stronger than themselves. They are carried along without resistance on their part or the exercise of their will. Moved like pawns on the chessboard of life, they play their parts and are laid aside after the game is over. But the masters, knowing the rules of the game, rise above the level of material life. By placing themselves in touch with the higher powers of their nature, they dominate their own moods, characters, qualities, and vibration as well as the environment surrounding them. Thus they become movers in the game, instead of pawns, causes instead of effects. The Summa Masters do not escape the causation of the higher levels, but become one with the higher laws. They form a conscious part of the law, rather than being its blind instrument. While they serve on the higher levels, they rule on the material level. On all levels of existence the law is always in operation and ever in evidence. Look at the phenomenon of the deep trance medium who gives guidance by allowing its body to be used by a disembodied, earthbound spirit. This is due to the cycle of the law of cause and effect. There is the want and desire of the disembodied, earthbound spirit to participate in the embodied game of the material level. There is the want and desire of the medium who is being used to channel other entities, to participate in the game of the spiritual ego. Throughout the ages, the word spirits referred to liquids containing ethanol. Since ancient times, only the highest masters were capable of altering these liquids into storage vessels of living knowledge. These masters operate in harmony with higher laws of nature, so that they may rule on the lower levels of manifestation. The minds of those who consume the nectar publications are immersed in the living knowledge, 